So um, two years ago, we had a discussion at the Dev Summit um, about moving towards a service-oriented architecture, and the main arguments that were brought up were around um, decoupling teams, establishing interfaces between uh, teams and services, um, improving security by um, isolating functionality and reducing the privilege uh, each service has to the bare minimum. Um, testing, improving testing by having these interfaces to test again rather than have one big monolithic application. Um, fault isolation so that um, if one service goes down, uh, only ideally a particular feature is affected rather than the entire site. Um, then an increased ability to leverage other platforms and projects. So we can use existing um, libraries, tools, even if they're not in PHP. And finally, um, have an incremental path towards narrower interfaces from the monolithic, fairly monolithic application we have uh, in MediaWiki. Um, two years later, um, we have a lot more services now. Um, the green ones are basically new since uh, Parsleet, as one of the things that people see often as one of the services, was already deployed by then. Um, so we got Mathlead, which is using MathJax. Uh, mostly, it's basically a super thin wrapper on MathJax, and um, that is maintained by a separate foundation. We have Graphlead wrapping Vega, um, again, third party, uh, client side code. Cytoid, which is wrapping Zotero, which we are not super happy with, but at least it got us started, <laughs> um, which is actually a, a browser plugin, usually, Mozilla browser plugin. Um, yeah, and a couple others that we built ourselves, like RESTBase, Analytics Query Service, ORES uses machine learning uh, things in, in Python. Um, Wikidata Query Service um, uses a graph database. Um, Quantum Translation is a Node.js service. Offline Content Generator is a Node.js service, um, which is generating PDFs. When you click on the, this article as PDF, that is basically what is producing that. And finally, um, Reading has created a service to massage uh, content for the apps and increasingly also the, map, the web experience. Um, yeah, and EventBus is a very new, the latest arrival, um, which is a small um, wrapper around Kafka, an event bus, or event queue. Um, and there's a couple more in the pipeline, uh, like Thumbboard, using Thumbboard for uh, thumbnailing. It's an existing Python uh, thumbnailing service. And security, I know, is considering to uh, move out password uh, storage and to, into a separate service to minimize the code that has access to, these, uh, to this information. And there's discussion about maybe having an API-driven front-end service. And there's a couple more um, services that we don't typically consider services that are mainly um, maintained by third parties. But there's also a couple of new ones like Elasticsearch, Cassandra, Logstash, Kafka, and of course, MariaDB, MySQL, Apache, the classics, Varnish. So a lot of services, actually, and a lot of them new. So what has worked well? This is a couple of things that I came up with. Um, there, I think the clear interfaces um, that we defined, APIs, have helped uh, decouple development. Early on, for example, in Parsuite, we had one team developing the parsing side in Parsuite and one team working on Visual Editor. And there was an interface in between. There was a DOM spec. And that allowed both teams to coordinate at this boundary and test independently at this boundary and, and so on. So I think that has overall worked well. And we had even had third party users use these APIs uh, for things that we didn't foresee. So content translation, for example, came out of that, out of an experiment that third party users um, just set up. Um, testing um, is working generally fairly well. I think most of these the bigger third party, serv uh, bigger services have pretty good test coverage. Um, like RESTBase and Parsuit and, and so on. Um, the, there's mocking 
that we're doing to basically mock out existing API calls and so on. And in some cases, we just use the existing infrastructure, just hit production, basically. Um, we used quite a few third-party projects that I already mentioned. Um, we got to share some things between client and server, including both code and skills. Um, fault isolation, we had cases where services like um, OCG went down and it only affected the PDF render feature. It didn't bring out the entire site, even though it was a catastrophic failure for that service. Um, that is a good thing. If we basically, it doesn't make a deploy uh, potentially everything breaks because one minor feature had an issue um, problem. Um, then we had op Swagger Open API specs. So they're now renamed. The Linux Foundation actually adopted the Swagger spec, and um, it's now under their auspices, I guess, um, and renamed. Um, we use that for API documentation and, and our generation of documentation, and uh, there's also derived monitoring, testing, and um, client generation. So you can run basically a tool to generate a Python client for an API that makes it easy to interact with based on the spec. And we have managed to share some infrastructure um, across services by standardizing a couple of things like service runner, service template node, that is a project to make it easy to get started building a Node.js based service. And there's a puppet module that is used across these services by exploiting this uniform interface. Um, issues, there's also, it's not all awesome. Um, the basically bug number zero, um, documentation could be better, and uh, infrastructure could also always be better and more streamlined. That's a perennial thing, and so we are working on that. It's not an unfixable problem, but it takes time. Um, Installation and maintenance for third-party users is something we haven't really, we have mostly ignored for quite a while. We didn't really have a plan for how to tackle that. And um, recently, um, we've created a, a Docker-based uh, prototype that basically makes it easy to install and keep a MediaWiki install up to date. Um, that is very early days, and we don't have a clear ownership for that, and we don't have a, any resourcing for it officially, so it's a side project at this point. But I do think that we need to figure out um, who owns this and what our strategy for, for this is. We had a session about it yesterday, and um, Gilles pr presented a straw man there um, that we might, um, that we could consider setting basically solving this problem and then setting a date at which we say we don't support PHP only installs anymore. We now require services. They have become part of MediaWiki. And um, that requires us to actually solve this and demonstrate that it's solved. So I think we need to actually get serious about it, make a plan, get the resources in place and do it and tell everybody that we are committed to that rather than it's just an experiment. Um, then ownership and responsibility for some services is not clear. That is not necessarily super special to services. That's an issue in other code as well. But um, it's, it needs to be solved nevertheless. Um, one example is LCG. It's a service that was started in a, with a lot of time pressure because some other data center depended on the shutdown of a data center depended on this being ready. And um, now there's no clear team owning this. And um, we basically need to find a process to um, either find a new owner to adopt the service and to take on the responsibility of fixing issues, but and also get the freedom to actually make the decisions that are necessary. Like, and, and those are often product decisions, like do we need PDF rendering? Or how good does PDF and rendering need to be? And, those are prioritization and resource allocation questions that are uh, not just technical questions. And so we need to make sure that the team that owns such a service and has the responsibility to run it also can make these decisions, I think. Um, ultimately, it's about aligning incentives, I think. Um, if you build it, you run it, kind of. 
So if you mess up and make um, build something unreliable, you will get the pager, and I will basically teach you very quickly. <laughs> and um, yeah, that's a nice talk by Randy Shoup. If you have the, the slides are linked from the um, talk description, so if you want to have a look, there's a link. Uh, goes more into depth about aligning incentives and nudging people in the right direction, making it easy to do the right thing rather than have a central big planning thing. And now I'm done. Okay. <laughs> so, discuss. Uh, uh, this is Matt Flashen. Uh, re regarding like uh, being able to develop things in new programming languages and environments, I think that's definitely a benefit in some cases because it allows you to use a tool that's better for the job. But on the other hand, uh, having having like a wide variety of programming languages and and environments in use impose a greater maintenance cost in the long run, so that has to be considered uh, by the overall organization and ecosystem in considering uh, balancing the need for maintainability with the need to use the, the best tool for the job or what's considered the best tool for the job. So I think we need to bear that in mind. Yeah, that was something that was pushed by Ops, especially initially, that we um, should limit the number of platforms that we support because there's a cost to supporting each of those. And right now we have basically PHP, Python, and Node.js primarily. Some Java now, but uh, there was a lot of resistance, or is a lot of resistance still, so. So you, you just, this is Rob Lionfear, um, you just mentioned the resistance to other programming languages um, and, um, and, you're, and you're being a champion for, it, for us having, uh, like basically use the right tool for the job, use whatever programming language is appropriate for that particular job. Um, do you see their being sensible limits to how many programming languages that we would introduce? Yeah, absolutely. I agree with um, having a limited number because I think the, the benefits, there's a diminishing returns. I mean, if you, what do you gain from having 25 programming languages apart from novelty factor? There's ultimately not that many platforms that actually have decent libraries and so on where there's a strong use case for, or a strong case to be made for using why that is the strongest, best, best tool for something. Um, I'm not sure that we used OCaml for a long time, but I think most people are happy that we didn't use depend on it much anymore because we didn't have a lot of people maintaining it. And we have a lot more JavaScript developers. Hey, um, thanks for this. Um, I, I think it's quite excellently put. I think, um, uh, I'm Ori, by the way, I'm with the performance team. Um, the, what we should remember is the point is not to have 16 programming languages or 17 programming languages or to identify you know, the, the precise numerical amount, but to, I think, have a shift in our thinking where we put more value on the power that individuals and teams can have when we give them freedom to use their talents and to use their skill and to use their experience um, in, in the way that they know, as opposed to um, exercise uh, an exaggerated level of mutual oversight that often leads to a stifling of um, innovation and a diminution of overall productivity. All right. Um, so I will definitely say a critique also of services. I don't think we've quite lived up to the security promises that we've, we've done. I feel like we have not done the segmentation that uh, we should do. I think that's a critique of, well, just not having enough time to do it all. Um, so I think we should keep pushing on that, and I would sort of certainly encourage that. Um, on the languages side of things, um, definitely with, as we bring in new languages, I like how with Node.js we have a template um, that we're starting with. I think that's a, a sane way to start, especially with the security review process. It's easy to say, 
okay, they're using the services template. I kind of have a basic expectation about how this is going to be, you know, stuff's going to happen here. When we start over fresh with the new Python framework, then we have to start over from scratch and review, do a lot more review to do that. So I would definitely strongly encourage let's keep doing templates for anything that we, uh, we decide we're going to roll out production. Uh, I, I want to push push back a little bit on the team autonomy thing because while, while teams definitely can can work better in the short term if they have like more more autonomy on exactly I'll use the library I know best because I have experience with that and I think it's a good tool for the job so I'm going to add another library to Composer and just go ahead and use it but in the in the long term like that team is not going to be maintaining that feature forever people are going to move on get assigned to a different feature maybe leave the foundation stop working on MediaWiki so like. The, uh, the autonomy has to be a balance with the, des the desire to have one ecosystem that we're going to be maintaining long term and and have 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 like a, a critical mass of stuff that we're, we're willing and have either the knowledge to maintain or at least it's within like touching distance of, of stuff that we can we can learn to maintain rather than just everyone picks their own library and has full autonomy over absolutely everything. Yeah, I agree with that. Also, from a vertical perspective, so with teams like security and uh, the performance team, being able to uh, have more operational insight into different teams, what, what they are doing, and be able to assist them when they need help, uh, is quite important when there's not too many languages at play. I'm Murray Pessur. I'm working with the Department of Agriculture using the MediaWiki software. And I didn't see it up here, but I know it's in everybody's thinking that Composer is an important tool to use here. And I'd like to just also say that maybe we should have something that lets us talk to shared hosting providers as well, because not all of our um, users of MediaWiki software are going to be able to get to the command line and use Composer effectively. So if there's uh, some, some way to insinuate that into the conversation a little bit, I'd like to do that. Yeah, we, we had that discussion yesterday to some degree, but um, I guess the question is if you start from a solution or if you start from I'm a user with these technical skills and I want to spend this much money and I really want to get as much nice functionality and performance as possible. And if you treat it more as a high level optimization problem, then you can kind of choose several solutions and maybe there are some others that like virtual machines that are now coming within reach, but there's also still, um, yeah, there's problems to be solved there. And um, I think the, I personally think that using shared hosting is, as an environment that we don't control is very difficult to build up on because it, we have to deal with a lot of variability and we can't do most of the things that we would like to do. While in some other cons more constrained environments, where, like a virtual machine with containers, we actually can use very little limited effort to by, by standardizing on a couple of things to provide a lot more functionality for the user. So I personally think that that's a more promising approach. But Yeah, I take your point on that. Um, I think that the question I'm going to get as an application developer is going to come from the people that run a data center and they're going to say, well, what do you need for you to build your application here? And if I could hold up a piece of paper that had the whole list on it, that would be very convenient. That's just the way the government's going to do it. Yeah, a recipe. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm Chad. I just want to um, add to what you said about the that's the way the government's going to do it. Um, it's also how a lot of private industry is going to want to do it as well. Um, even if we go the route of you know properly packaging everything into a nice container you know so it's effectively you know throw it on a vm and everything's there for you already contained um, that's not how the security review process in government and a lot of private industry especially like banking industry works so if we have users in those areas you know even though we've built the container for them they're still going to want to review the different environments that we're then exposing them to at that point so like if you know we have rest space you know for example you know they're going to want to know you know like no js is going to have to be acceptable in their environment at that point not um, just you know the, the the core php you know lamp stack that we have right now so that's just something to consider as well like even if we 
even if we make it easy to install, like there's still gonna be cognitive overhead for third party users who are gonna have concerns about installing these extra things in their environments where they might have you know, real security concerns as well. So it's just something to keep in mind. This is kind of two ends of the spectrum, like the super lockdown, uh, want to move really slowly, um, and, and the other is uh, people who install the wiki ones and never upgrade, even if it has major security issues, because it's just too hard. And I guess we can maybe focus more on the, on the small installs, because I think those have the hardest time keeping up right now. I just want to add to uh, what he said. I uh, forget what his name was. Um, that's a comment a few, few times ago. Uh, I think it was Roy. Yeah, Ray. Um, so I, I mentioned a few small installs on shared hosting, and um, I just wanted to add that, like I said, like there's, there's a balance between um, how much user has access to and how much they are capable uh, as, a, as an engineer or a site administrator, and there tends to be some kind of connection there, but not necessarily there. So, for example, I you know manage things in production at Wikimedia, but I also have some shared hosting wikis because I've had them for a long time, and it's just convenient to keep them around that way. Also, for the customer to not have to have the overhead of restarting a server or something like that, like it's very convenient. But I wanted to add that it doesn't necessarily require command on access to install MediaWiki, right? So, if you want to make contributions back upstream, you might need Composer and Git and all those things. But if you just want to install MediaWiki. Um, aside from all the many shared hosting providers that have a one-click install solution, which is even easier, as, even aside from that, we, we, we provide tarballs that already include all the component vendors, so you don't actually need to run Composer install manually. Like, there, there, we, we provide a package that already contains all the PHP files statically rendered for you just to install right on your server, uh, without a container, that is. It's just a tarball of some PHP files, basically. Hi, I'm Max. So I would like to point out that in general, services are much harder to debug and tune as opposed to just uh, scripts that you drop into Apache root, simply because uh, it, it requires more qualification you can't uh, simply hack uh, something quickly in a service because uh, it would be harder to get the data out of it. So, and I'm even talking about uh, simple sysadmin tasks, not, not about development, but just uh, you started Parsoid, something goes wrong. I would say that uh, Debugging problems in Parsoid would be harder than doing the same for MediaWiki. Well, I guess the if you juxtapose a simple script and a relatively complex service like Parsoid, then I agree with you. But I think the alternative is not that, but one huge blob of a lot of complex functionality that interacts in random ways and several smaller blobs that do complex things but they are relatively, they're smaller and their interactions are easier to understand because you can look at the traffic and there's interfaces. So that's basically the, what this is aiming at, the scaling issue of how can I make still understand what the service does by limiting its scope and defining clear interfaces. Yeah. Sure, yeah. Uh, so, context question, what was the purpose of the meeting? Is it more of an educational or solution finding? Because, so, the reason why I ask is, it feels like there's just a bunch of laundry lists of complaints right now, right? And I'm wondering if we, if you wanted more of a, let's talk about what we should do next type conversation. Because um, in, in my view, from release engineering, um, I think services are going well. Um, the only things that I'm really wanting to see improved from, from my perspective is, you know, kind of things that you're wanting to improve, which is um, 
the ownership and you know you get the pages, you get responsibility, but also who's responsible for what. So like going through that, doing that exercise of who's responsible for which services, what's the actual person's name, <laughs> not even a team, you know, like a, a name or, or team, whatever. But um, you know, that kind of conversation. And I think that might help push forward some of these other aspects that people are complaining about languages or whatever. That might make those conversations actually practical at that point, so. Yeah, more accountability. Yeah. Yeah, I think I was hoping to basically see if there's other things that people see or if this is mainly the ones that most people see as pressing. So, and then maybe brainstorm. So I have two things to say. Um, first of all, the saying that you either have a big monolith blob or a small herd of services is something of a false dichotomy because you can have a well librarized code that runs in PHP. Um, the second thing that I wanted to say was that I like services for performance and scalability. I'm not all that fond of having bespoke services that are required for core functionality. And again, that would be a nice case for a PHP library that we could use in core or we could use from a service that's running in PHP for higher scalability and performance. But I don't think that that has been considered at all by anybody. Uh, <laughs> that's a recurring discussion, I guess. Could be right past it in PHP, basically. We, we had that a couple times yesterday and it's, it's not easy. There's no, as Subu mentioned, Subu here? Oh. Subu, do you want to say something? <laughs> Closing words? Uh, if this is specifically about Parsoid, I said this yesterday. And uh, so right now, even today, there is no P HTML5 parser in PHP, so we cannot do it. Uh, we cannot do parser in PHP. That's all I have to say about that right now. It is, I, I just have one question. Is there a HTML5 parser in C or C++? There are some, but interfacing them okay, with PHP. Okay, why not make a P is not Sorry. <laughs> I, I apologize. Why not make a PHP module or, or Apache module to interface with, with those. We actually I'm not, investigated and, and, that. <laughs> anyway. Uh, I did uh, sort of review a whole lot of HTML5 uh, libraries, uh, including uh, looking at the C and C++ modules. And really, there aren't many. Um, there's uh, the one that, that is in Mozilla is actually um, generated code. Uh, it's generated C++ code, which depends on a whole lot of random stuff throughout the uh, yeah. Mozilla Firefox code base. So it's it's not, you can't really easily split it out and put it in a library. So really there aren't uh, C, C++ options for HTML5 parsers. There is actually a PHP option. Uh, it's not uh, it's not perfect. It would need a couple of months of work probably. But uh, yeah, it's not far off. Good.